Sydney once again as we bring you another edition of AFCON today. And uh, of course, it's uh, a look ahead to a very big explosive, uh, I'm talking about a potentially explosive weekend of football. And it's here on Joy Prime and also on 421 on DSTV. Thank you so much for joining us for this afternoon's edition. Samia Moesi is seated and Victor Achu Tamaklo is also seated. There's a lot to talk about this afternoon, especially as we zoom in on the quarterfinal stage of the competition. Who goes away and who continues to stay for a fight for the ultimate prize of the Africa Cup of Nations uh, title. The show is proudly sponsored by MTN. MTN, everywhere you go. So in a moment, we're going to be getting into the conversations. But gentlemen, good to have you once again. Good to see you. Thanks. Thanks. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So we're back again. Yeah. And um, Hopefully look. we upset <laughs> less people or fewer people than, than <laughs> The feedback from that conversation about Andre Ayu has been very interesting. Very well. Yeah. Tell, tell it, me about some of the, it, it just some of the goes conversations. To show you that people care about the black stars. Mm. People are passionate about the black stars. And they will channel that energy and passion in communicating their thoughts about their favorite players and even how the team ought to be run. And this morning, I've had some really interesting views about mm. how this team has to be run going forward and, and if we are to make any kind of progress. One thing is clear. People, even amongst the, even in the midst of the varying views, agree that we have to make some progress and things shouldn't stay the same. But I mean, making progress, I mean, I will still maintain my, 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 my thoughts. It started with the bosses at the FA because you, can't, you don't expect change whilst you are not changing. You can't do the wrong things and you expect different results. And so I think that just like what I actually is saying, same thing, I think I received a, a call from, from, from an um, um, SS friend colleague asking me why am I being so hard on Andre Ayu. But I mean, it's obvious. The lad is 30, 33, 34, and it's never been the same. And so I think that we're making progress, ages players, we don't have to entertain them. Because listen, we've seen Spain doing, we've seen England doing, the likes that we are letting from them. They are making progress. They are moving on from old, old players. And so I think that for us to also make progress, I think we need to leave Yes, he's been key. He served the country well. But I think we've come to a stage where we need to move on from such, such place. It's as simple as that. Mm. Well, uh, making progress is a very interesting uh, subject, especially when it comes to the Black Stars. I was having a conversation with the nutritionist of the Black Stars. Um, I hope she gets to keep her place there. <laughs> and uh, I was telling her the same thing about uh, football fans and how we sometimes try to hide our emotions around the Black Stars. We and pretend we don't our, care. our sentimental feel towards the Black Stars. Look. Just do some very simple research. Step out of your building, whether it's your office, whether it's your home, yeah. whether it's your school or place of worship, on a day when the Black Stars are playing, uh, you know, especially on a stage like the Africa Cup of Nations. So you see that relatively there's a lot less movement, there's a lot less noise, because everybody is focusing on the screen yeah. because they want to see a result or two. Mm -hmm. And yesterday, Stone also said the same thing about the Black, uh, you know, the Super Eagles of Nigeria, yeah. where there's a lot of harsh criticism, but then every other time that the team gets into action is mm -hmm. a different uh, you know, story and a different ball game. And I know that there will be a lot of that this weekend as Nigeria go into uh, the quarterfinal stage. It didn't look very good for Nigeria. They uh, were not necessarily a highly tipped team, but here they are in the competition. Ivory Coast, also another big story of recovery. And as hosts, their continuous stay in the competition always helps. But where do we cut that and start looking at the football and the excitement that they bring, as well as the, go the goals that they score that can get them the necessary three points and the necessary qualification to the next stage of the competition. All of these are part of the conversations we're going to be having here on AFCON today, which is here on Joy uh, Prime, which is also on 281 on DSTV. All right, so you uh, just uh, stay right there. We are doing a round of messages, and after that, we continue with uh, the conversations here on AFCON today. So there we are, there we go, this is it, as we look ahead to this big weekend. Guys, we'll begin with Nigeria versus Angola. It's a game we've already spoken about, but it's beginning to look like a super semi-final, or probably one that could even make a final because of what we've seen of both Angola and Nigeria. 
um, Nigeria for the recovery. And for me, it goes to highlight a very big element of uh, the, the values of the people of Nigeria, which was brought to bear or was made manifest way back in the 90s when we saw them win uh, Africa's first Olympic gold in football and all of that, the golden generation. Uh, they went ahead, they won the, uh, you know, they had, they had beaten us to win the 93 uh, edition of the under-17 tournament. They got banned afterwards, but, you know. But, you know, you're looking at it and you're seeing a certain element of perseverance and all of that, which will be brought to play here. And then we also see, in terms of technical ability, uh, a very strong forward line, which could be very, very troublesome. It, it could be. And I think one of the things Nigeria have done very well, even before we start talking about the on-field stuff, uh, or is something we have failed at, which is getting through this period of acclimatization and indoctrination, if you like, for the players who did not have any significant footballing education in Nigeria. So you're seeing the chunk of this team relying heavily on players who are educated elsewhere. And perhaps I've never even stayed in Nigeria for that long to even understand the ethos of the people of Nigeria, the essence of the national team, and what it takes beyond the talents to represent the team. So you're seeing Emmanuel Denise, you're seeing Simon Moses, you're seeing True Sekong, who's become the captain. And he's an embodiment of everything that you want to see in a player who didn't grow up in the country, but has registered and chosen to represent the country in the sense that he gives everything. And sometimes when I watch Trista come play, I get the impression that this guy knows at the back of his mind that there are some who doubt whether or not he gets what it means to be a Nigerian, what it, be, what it means to be a super eagle. And so he's out there to convince. And yes, he understands these criticisms that it comes from a good place. He understands these uh, skepticism or this kind of skepticism that it comes from a good place. People want the best for their country and they are, they are not sure if you are the guy to do that. The only way to answer some of these is on the pitch. And we've seen him being a wonderful leader for the team. Ola Aina as well, he's done quite well, although he has a very different story. But even he spent the chunk of his um, upbringing in Chelsea's academy, later in Torino, in Italy and all of that. So I don't know how they've gone about it. I don't know the inside story, but clearly they found a formula that has made all of these players settle in. It's taking quite some time uh, because the Simon Moses that played at the Barbara Sports Stadium against Gideon Mensah two years ago in that World Cup playoff, it's not the same player today. Yeah. He's applying himself more. He's given more. So maybe with time, we're going to get Inaki Williams and all of these players also show a similar appreciation of what the national colors mean. But I like the fact that the Super Eagles have managed to unlock or hack that. The other thing for me also is that Nigeria are not exactly the sort of team that you would say are peaking or are improving game on game in terms of how the team is structured. But we're seeing them getting more convincing results as the games go by. So after they beat La Côte d'Ivoire in their second group game, a lot of us expected that they would kick on and then completely blow away Guinea-Bissau. But we saw a risk-averse manager who fielded five defenders against Guinea-Bissau. Nigerians didn't like it, but it got the results for them. And then we saw what they did against Cameroon, which was, for me, without doubt, their best performance of the tournament in the sense that they completely shackled Cameroon from minutes one to 90. And then we saw um, Ademola Lukman scoring two goals in the tournament, which, which is something as illustrious a career Nigeria have got, um, as far as the AFCON is concerned, very rare because in the history of the AFCON, Nigeria has only had three tournaments where one player had more than three goal contributions. So, and they are all spread out. So in 1994, we had Rashidi Akini scoring four goals in that tournament. Ten years later, in Tunisia, we saw Austin J.J. Okocha. He scored four times. And then in 2019, um, Odione Gallo also scored five goals in that competition. So you are looking at a team that is not used to having players have significant numbers in terms of goal, score, goal contributions, be it goals or assists. But Ademola Lukman has got two. If he gets one, he joins that league of um, Yakini, Austin J.J. Okocha, and then Odion Igalos. And I think that against, against Angola, that is a team that he could well notch up the numbers and uh, contribute significantly. I'm not looking to see an exciting Nigerian performance. They haven't 
given us that in this tournament, they are at best a more functional unit that is better than the sum of its parts. And I think that against Angola, they really will be up against it. Mm. Now, um, for you, I mean, he's mentioned the game, you know, against Cameroon. For you, what was the striking moment which told you that Nigeria are here to probably do something spectacular? Yeah, well, I think, I mean, the, the last game against um, Cameroon, I think last week we were here and I spoke extensively about that. Yeah, because even though I made mention that even though already Song is under pressure to redeem himself, yeah, he didn't start the tournament, I mean, well. And in their final group game against the Gambia, you saw how they won that game. Very scrappy, but I think they were able to go through. I mean, they went through. But coming up against them, um, I mean, the Nigerians, I, I, I said that they need to tread cautiously. And I made mention that with the forward line of Nigeria, Ademola, Lukman, Osimene, and even Simon Moses, the least chance, even though they've not clicked as a team, but the least opportunity that they get to try as much as possible to capitalize on. But we saw how they play against, I mean, I mean Cameroon. They have not really been that good and the pressure from, I mean, from all angles. And so for me, how they played out and how they were able to win that game, that g it gave me that conviction that, listen, if you're coming to meet against Nigeria, you need to trade cautiously. Even though from the start of the tournament, Jose Posero, who's the head coach of Nigeria, he came out a, a little bit of under pressure because they also they didn't start the tournament well. But from game by game, I'm thinking that they've, they, they warmed themselves into the tournament, tournament properly. And you saw how they play against Cameroon. You saw how, I mean, tactically, and how disciplined they were. It gave me that conviction. And coming up against Angola tomorrow, yes, Angola have been okay. They've been... Brilliant. I mean, massive credit to, I mean, Pedro, I mean, Concalves, who's the head coach of the side. But I think that it, once again, they come up against this Nigerian side. That have, I think that they've stumped the authority in this tournament. But then again, you, you can't also discredit Angola because they've done something very wonderful. You have Freddie in there who was already giving three assists. You have uh, Mbub uh, Mbubulu there. And I mean, uh, even their striker, uh, um, um, Gelson Dalla also there. So they have a very good players. But for me, I think that Nigeria from the uh, defense and even with Nigeria, also the, the goalkeeper, I mean, has also recovered and it's expected to sign. So, from the, from the post to, I mean, the forward liners, very, very good players. But from how they played against Cameroon, I'm thinking that Angola have been wonderful. They've played some very good football. They've been disciplined. But I'm thinking that from how they played against Cameroon, I think that with this same tactics and with that same discipline, I think that they will try over, I mean, against or over Angola. Now, we, we've had situations where we've had to predict wrongly or project wrongly. For instance, for sites like Senegal yeah. and Morocco, uh, at the initial stage, based on the rating and based on what we saw of them in the first one or two games, we thought, look, these were the teams that were going to make it. And of course, these sites, the likes of Senegal, the likes of Morocco, are the point of draw for everybody, every eyeball, especially outside of the continent in different parts of the world. And so we were not too, uh, you know, uh, wrong, but then when it came to playing and when it came to getting the results, we got some surprises. Now, how much of a surprise element are we expecting as Angola come up? What kind of arsenal are Angola bringing into this game, and what kind of mindset are you expecting them to, especially knowing the kinds of stakes there? They're going up against Nigeria, no matter what the situation is. No matter what the situation, it's a, heav a heavyweight against a lightweight contest. Nigeria are 42nd. They are the highest ranked team um, as far as the FIFA rankings are concerned, remaining in the tournament. And then you are looking at the least ranked in what, 128th, is it, of Angola. So there is that disparity in terms of quality between the two teams. Never mind what we've seen at this tournament, that indeed the margins may be finer than the rankings do suggest. One thing for me is how Nigeria deal with the star power of girls and Dalla. So far, they've had a mixed bar. And I think apart from the opening game where Emilio Nsua did a trick for Equatorial Guinea, every big name that you can think of, when they've come up against the Super Eagles in this tournament, they've been shackled. So Sekou Fofana played a blinder in Cote d'Ivoire's first game against uh, Guinea-Bissau, but the Nigerian midfield and defense found a way of blocking the spaces and ensuring that they created traffic in all of the zones that he could run into. And so if you watched Ivory Coast game versus Senegal. All the third runs, the final runs from deep that Sekou Fofana was making against Nigeria, he couldn't make any of those. And the few times that he did, they ensured that they had to circuit 
short circuit the attack. And so the supply lines were blocked. So he will make the run all right, but he ensured that nothing will come to where he will be to finish off a chance or wreak some havoc. Against Cameroon, we saw what they did as well. For 90 minutes, they shut up shop and then blocked out everything that they did. The problem here for them against Angola is that Gelson Dalla is not only a finisher. In this team, he's assumed the responsibility of a creator. And so in the Angolan team, he's created the most chances at this tournament, which is among the highest as far as the tournament itself is concerned. He's created eight chances. So the problem for them will be finding a way to shackle him. But do you take your eyes off him? Because Angola have shown us that they've got a three-prong attack. Gilson Dalla is just one part of the triangle that has led them to this point. And apart from the opening day that when they drew with Algeria, they have beaten every team that they, they've played. They've won every other match that they have played. And I would want to see how they handle that, but also maintain that spacing between Victor Osim and Simon Moses, Ademola Lukman, and even the supporting Kasbian. Because if Osim is required to do too much in this game, it may be counterproductive for Nigeria because, look, Angola have shown us in this tournament that they are a significantly better team than what Cameroon have shown us this tournament. And so what it will take to beat Angola will be different. And I agree with Jose Pesero when in his post-match interview he says that only their best performance can guarantee them a victory. Mm. Sami, um, so only their best performance can guarantee them a victory. Um, what are you looking at? If you, for instance, were pushed to give us what realistically could be the end uh, you know, of this Nigeria-Angola clash, <laughs> who would you settle for? Oh, I, I, I'll still go for Nigeria. Okay. Honestly, because I think that, yeah, I mean, just like what I just said, it's, it's more of like, <laughs> I don't know how to describe it, it's more of like you, you are coming up to face, I mean, a side that they have been dominant, I mean, in, in some part of the game, but Angola also have done so well. But for me, looking at how Nigeria, I mean, have been playing throughout the whole tournament, I, I think that they didn't really start well for me. But I think that from where they've come and how they've played, especially the game against Cameroon, that, it gives me that conviction that they have not gotten there. They have not gotten their rhythm. And so any side that they come up against, they walk into that game with that confidence and know that they are going to, I mean, win that game. So for me, yes, it's going to be a, a game. I'm not expecting that cricket scoreline. And again, I'll make this statement. If you've won Nigeria, once they get the ball at the back of your net, it's very difficult for you to score. And it's, it tells you how disciplined they are defensively. And so for me, I'm, I'm thinking that Nigeria will go through. I think Angola, very wonderful side. But for me, I'm so much convinced about Nigeria and their chances. Well, interesting stuff there. And um, scoreline-wise as well, what could we be possibly looking at? I think Angola will get this. Because they are going to present problems that Nigeria may not have encountered in this tournament. I mentioned the three players that everyone has been talking about in this tournament for Angola. How is it possible? I mean, in the history of the AFCON, you find strikers who don't often multitask. So they are either creators or they are goal scorers. In the case of Gelson Dalla, he is the tournament's second top scorer. He scored a brace on two occasions. But in terms of even the best creators and chance creators in this tournament, he ranks as high as everyone that you can think of with eight. So, the problem for Nigeria will be how they keep the taps on Gelson Dalla, Mabululu himself, and then the third man. So, as I have said, this is going to be the biggest test that the Nigerian defense has faced. And I don't think they would have enough in them to stop Angola. Okay, so we would switch over now to DR Congo and Guinea. Yes. Now, DR Congo and Guinea have a very um, interesting tale to tell us. Uh, DR Congo, we're not expecting much from them. They are here, yeah. and they have always proven a tough side to beat. Now, you're looking at the story of Guinea, who had to go through a, a period of political instability. They're still running through those lines and are under military rule, but um, they've also come this far. And performances such as these sure will bring a lot of relief to the people. It will. Um, for the first time in... This will be the third time if they're able to win this game in the history of the country that they have managed to win three wins. They have managed three wins at the AFCON. So I think in 78, was it? They managed that in Egypt 2006 as well. They managed to do that when they won three games in that tournament. And 
if you look at what they've done in this tournament, it's, it's been absolutely remarkable. Um, Mohamed Bayo, who scored the winner in that final game, is one of the inf most influential players for Guinea at this tournament. He scored two goals already. If he scores a third, he will become only the second player for the Guineans at the AFCON to have scored that many goals um, in 19, in 22 years, or is it 18? Pardon my mind, in 18 years, because the last time it happened was in 2006 in Egypt. The great Pascal Fendono, he scored three goals in that tournament. Of course, when he came to Accra in 2008 as well, he, had, he played a blind out of a tournament for Guinea in that competition. But DR Congo themselves have got a bit of star power, and I think that it is the difference between this team and the teams that we saw in 2019 in Egypt and then in Cameroon in 2021, in the sense that while the team technically is a bit more balanced and a bit coached with a bit more tactical nose than it was in the past, there are some tangibles that tactics cannot replace, which is a player who assumes responsibility and is a match winner for the team. And I think that's what they found in Meshach Elia, um, in the goals that he has got for them in this particular competition. So in the last two competitions, they did not have a single player who made three goal contributions, but that's what Meshak Elia has done. And he's not scored many, he's scored one, and he sets up two goals. So gradually, you are beginning to see a replacement for them. Um, as for, you are beginning to see someone who steps up and assumes responsibility, a figure that they can build something around. Because what have we not said about Weiser? What have we not said about Cedric Bakambu? But the reputation he's gaining in these important matches, particularly at this AFCON, is that he will miss the chances. So it is refreshing that, and, and here's the other thing, Bakambu isn't always involved in the build-up to create chances for others. So it is refreshing that Meshak Elia is stepping up. And against Egypt, of all teams, he was the man when the team needed someone to step up. He got the goal, and in the second half, I think was a bit unlucky not to have scored in that particular game. So for me, the, I think that the margins are very fine between the two teams. And the names that I've mentioned, Meshak Elia, and then, of course, his Guinean counterparts, Mohamed Bayo, are the guys that I'm, I'm watching out for tonight. Okay. Well, um, let's see how that game goes. Let's now talk about, um, you know, the uh, other big one. And I'm talking about the hosts going up against Mali. Yeah. Now, um, the hosts have two titles to their credit. Interestingly, both of them came at the expense of Ghana. <laughs> now they have On a huge task. <laughs> now, Mali, around stages like these in this, in this competition, mm -hmm. can prove to be di difficult yeah. and dangerous. How much of the party can they mess up? And what kind of football should they play? Especially as they know that every single touch of the ball will be seen, uh, you know, pulling the fans to get them to make mistakes so that Cote d'Ivoire can repossess the ball and the fans in the stadium are going to be very, very hostile towards them. What kind of game do they play to ensure that they cause, the, cause once again, another very big upset? Well, I think it's, it's possible. And I think for me, I'm, I'm looking at the record that they are trying to chase because I think their best, I mean, performance in the tournament has been, I think, finished as runners-up, I think, in, in, in 1974, something like that. And then... In 2012 and 2013, they, 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 they finished on the third position. But you come up against, the, I mean, the host country, and you saw how all of them were able to, I mean, qualify. For Ivory Coast, I think, I don't know whether the sacking of their head coach was a blessing in disguise, because I watched the game against Senegal, and I'm, I, I, what I realized was that I think all their substitutions were spot on. And I think that is what did the magic for, 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 for them against Senegal, in, in my own perspective. But... Against Mali, I think that it, it, it's a game that for me, I, I had opportunities to listen to, I mean, the head coach, I mean, um, Eric Shelley, and then he was talking about how they are going to approach, I mean, the game against Ivory Coast. And I think it, 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 it's, it's all going to be about how, I mean, taking their chances for me, because they are, they are coming up against the host country. They've not been that exciting. They are not scoring that much goals and all that. I mean, you look at how they qualified and then they were able to eliminate the defending champions. Yes, everything can happen. But for me, I think that they need to really approach this game very, very, I mean, very well and take their chances. Because for Ivory Coast, I'm thinking that because they, they are the host country, regardless of whatever will happen, they, they will try as much as possible to dig deep and get the win. When the game traveled, after 90 minutes, went to penalties against Senegal. I was thinking that when, once it gets to penalties, I'm thinking that Senegal, that is where they also try to get, 
I mean, the opposition and try to knock them out. But you saw how they took their penalty and they, how, you saw how they eliminated them. And so for me, I'm thinking that for Mali, they have a simple thing to do. Approach the game very well, take your chances, and try as much as possible to upset them. Because we've seen Ivory Coast, they, they, they've been conceding all the games they've been conceding. So for me, I'm thinking that, yeah, very young side and, and all that. But for me, I'm thinking that if they're able to approach the game and take their chances, I'm thinking that they kind of, they'll be able to upset them and then perhaps even progress, I mean, to the semis. But it's all going to be about how both of them approach the, I mean, the game. All right, so um, we'll be doing uh, justice to the topic of South Africa, who are going up against Cape Verde. Cape Verde, uh, you know, the uh, boogie side of Ghana's Black Stars as things stand now. So we'll see how uh, that conversation goes as well. But you're still here on AFCON today. My name is Nathaniel Atto, and I'm here in the studio with Victor Achutamaklo, as well as Samuel Amirisi. We will be doing a round of messages in a bit so that we continue with the conversations. Do remember that we're taking a look at the quarterfinal stage and who is likely to emerge uh, out of all the pack. And of course, four will be merging into the final stages as we gradually get closer and closer to knowing who will win the trophy at the Africa Cup of Nations. Now, uh, gentlemen, Cape Verde. Cape Verde had their confidence grow. And that is one thing we'll be discussing uh, very much after the round of messages. But then uh, put this at the back of your minds. Now, Cape Verde have grown. And they've come to this tournament to make a certain major, major statement. But question is, are they going to be successful against another revived side, South Africa? All of those conversations we're going to be having right here after this round of messages. This is our phone today. Don't go anywhere. Remember, we are on 281 on DSTV and also on our streaming channels on YouTube. All right. A round of messages and more here on AFCON Today. Well, another game which sure will draw a lot of attendance, a lot of attention, and a lot of conversation from football fans, not only in Africa, but around the world. It's Cape Verde versus South Africa. Now, South Africa are the champions from 1996, and boy, oh boy, don't we remember all of those names who came to play some wonderful football. They were not my best friend in the semi-final because they beat the Black Stars to get to the final. Well, that's another conversation for another day. But hey, South Africa look revived and they look like they're ready for uh, telling a very, very interesting story. Yeah. Cape Verde also came in as a team with a certain tag and now they are rewriting the script. Yeah. But Cape Verde seemed to have a little bit of an, uh, you know, uh, an advantage in terms of the previous record or the head-to-head. -head. Could that come to play in any way? Even before we come to the AFCON dynamics and all of that, mm. I think there are lessons from South Africa's progress for us in Ghana. Um, especially in terms of the coaching appointments and how the enabling environment that is created for the manager to work. If you Google the name Hugo Bruce and add the word controversy, you'll find a litany of issues, right? Issues that in Ghana will be recipe for disaster. But there is a certain protection, there is a certain insurance that Hugo Bruce has in South Africa. And that is the liberty to do the work the way he seems fit. The liberty to make his own choices in terms of who plays for the national team. And he's not a saint. He's made some controversial decisions in terms of the collapse. Decisions that I would question. Decisions that any fair mind would question and would seek to understand it. But we don't see that happen very often here. In the 44-man preliminary squad that Hugo Bruce announced, last year. He named some players that you cannot explain why they were in the team, except to say that this is the coach's choice. And whether we like it or not, it's his way. He only needs to get us the results. So we're going to disagree with him, but this is your choice and we respect that. We're not going to interfere. He named Ethan Brooks, who plays for Amazulu. At the time, he had scored no goal or assist in 13 appearances for Amazulu but he named him in the squad. The same evidence Bakopa that we're heralding for that excellent free kick he scored against Morocco in the round of 16. At the time, he plays for Orlando Paris. At the time he was named in the squad, he had not scored a single goal all season. It was so bad that before he got called up, 
in the league match versus Polo Kwane City, evidence Makoba was booed by his own fans. But the coach named him in the squad. Because of the liberty that he has and because of how much power he has, he proceeded, he persisted with it. And so you would hear, some, and sometimes he goes overboard in his commentary when he says, this is my decision and the rest of you, you are not the ones who pay me. And borderline disrespectful, if you like. But generally, I'm talking about the lessons that we can learn from hiring a coach. By the way, you know for a fact that he nearly got the Ghana job in 2019. At the time, he was the AFCON winning coach. Mm. But we declined. We did not give him the job because Osei Chemin Sabonso had gone to parliament at that time and he said, we will give the job to a local coach. He said the country cannot afford what it will cost to maintain a foreign manager. The lessons here for me are the freedom and the power that the national team coach has got and also why we should not allow or the decision of who becomes the national team coach should not be a purely political and economic conversation because the considerations for me, the most important consideration has to be technical, right? And the structure that we have here for selecting our national coach, coaches simply does not work. We, we put a number of football administrators into a room and we assume that they will be able to make sense of the tactical needs of our national teams and say that we are going to trust their judgment. That is why you have Ivy League educated, super successful football administrators, super successful businessmen. But the moment you give them the job of hiring the Black Stars coach, they fail. It is not because they are not smart. It is not because they are not intelligent, but it is a job that requires unique set of skills, skills they do not have. So going forward, I would like to see a situation where if we have to form up or if we have to put together a technical unit that is responsible for the hiring of coaches, yes, you can make an input, right? When the ministry determines its budget, you can communicate that decision to the committee that is going to determine who becomes the coach but not necessarily say that we're going to throw a banker there, we're going to throw uh, an IT specialist there to go and interview who becomes, what conversation are they going to have with this person? You get me? So we need to ask, we need to make adjustments to the way we run football and look at some of the modules are, because the things that are happening, they are not otherworldly. There are things that we have done before under Ben Kofi. The people who were choosing national team coaches or making significant inputs. When Ben Kofi tells you this guy is a good coach, you, you know you can trust that judgment. So that for me is important that while we're enjoying the brilliance of South Africa and the football that they are playing, we also take lessons from what is giving them the success, right? Because in the last four AFCON campaigns that South Africa have gone to, they've made the quarterfinals on three occasions. Check their re the record before that. Mm. Mm. It says enough about what this management culture is producing for them and why they are persistent with it. So get the manager and give him the power yeah. and the resource to get the job done yeah. and fold your arms and watch. And that's exactly what uh, South Africa are telling us now. Now Cape Verde. Cape Verde were, were part of Ghana's troubles uh, at this tournament. <laughs> and clearly you could see that they have trouble shown, number one <laughs> yeah you know they have a lot of mental toughness yeah. and they will run at you as well um what kind of game in terms of the entertainment are you expecting in this clash well, for me i think it's going to be an exciting game honestly but before even that you remember our head of the afcon kets described i mean hugo bruce as a, as, as a top guy isn't it so yeah. he tells you the admiration for for hugo <laughs> bruce for me i think that is a, is, is a wonderful manager but i mean but but, but uh, with your caution you I'm saying that it's going to be an exciting game because just like what you said, Cape Verde, a very, very difficult side. And I think that I was very much surprised with how the way we've been able to stand against Egypt. And that two to draw was, I mean, a game that you'd be like, wow, these guys are really in there to prove a point. And so you look at their progression into the tournament and how far they've come. I think that you don't have to underrate them. You don't have to underrate, even though with the game against, I think, Mauritania, they have to dig deep before they get that goal. I think in the 86th or 87th minute, and then uh, Ryan Mendes converted that penalty. But generally, I think that he's a very well-drilled side. And massive, massive credit to the manager. I think he knows how to 
I mean, in terms of the personnel, in terms of the selection, and tactically how he deploys his players is, 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 is spot on. But for South Africa, I think for me what is doing the magic for them is because they have an experienced manager in there, a coach that understands his players, a coach that understands when and how to bring in players. And we shouldn't forget, he's won the AFCON with Cameroon. And so all these things come together and then it's, it's gives you that plus that you can trust this manager because he's done it before. And I think that experience for, I mean, uh, that's Hugo Bruce has. I think for me, that is what is doing the magic for them. But for the game itself, just like what I said, it's going to be an exciting and entertaining game. But you look at how South Africa are playing and you look at how Kivet is playing. I think if he travels beyond 19 minutes, I wouldn't be surprised. Because you, look, you saw how South Africa played against Morocco how tactically disciplined they were, how defensive they were, not giving room for, I mean, for, 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 for Morocco to operate within. It tells you how, also, how good they are. But for me, I think that if they travel beyond 90 minutes, I wouldn't be surprised. But at the end of the day, I think South Africa will go through on penalties because they have an experienced manager in Hugo Bruce. If it, if it travels to penalty shootouts, my money will be, to extra time, my money will be on South Africa because Kivet have the second oldest team in this tournament. Yes. They have an average age of 29 years um, and 64 days. Yeah. The last time we saw a team that old at the AFCON was way back in 98 with Egypt, when they had a team of, with an average age of 30. But the curious thing about these old legs, legs as we would like to call them for um, Kivet, are that unlike in Ghana's case, when we send the old men and they cost us, mm -hmm. for Kivet, they are delivering the goods. Did you know that? Of the eight goals that Kivet have scored in this tournament, five of them have been scored by players 30 years or yeah. older. So the old, they are taking the old men to these tournaments and their performances are justifying why they need to go. They've been the difference makers, except that given the number of games they've played in this tournament and especially the exertions they had to make in the previous game, I think South Africa are better conditioned to deal with the exertions of a 180 minutes game than Cape Verde. Well, that is the full description at two, uh, you know, that, that you know, um, Victor is giving us. Now, uh, Karim, we need you here because we need to take a look at the top liner for today. Pay attention the again to <laughs> yeah. how he makes his appearance. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, that's Karim. <laughs> you know, Karim has been a subject of internal gossip here. <laughs> today, Karim did work. Yeah. He didn't form an act. <laughs> and uh, check out our social media handles. We're going to bring you a video of Karim's uh, way of walking here into the <laughs> studio. Uh, that's what fuels all the gossip. Okay, Karim, take us through um, for the figures that we should be expecting for the Nigeria game. Nat, I seriously wanted to here. <laughs> <laughs> he's watching from wherever he is. Maybe. Yeah. He's yeah, still watching. Shouts to you, Stone. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> he can still listen and take what I'm going to see. Yeah. Okay. Um, now, per the World Bank data of 2021, Nigeria has a population of 313.4 million. That is six times that of Angola, mm. which is 34.5 million. And looking at the squads, the squad of Nigeria, mm -hmm. if you're looking at market value of the whole squad, Nigeria has a market value of 332 million euros. And South Africa has just, and Angola has just 22.25 million euros. Mm -hmm. That is like getting to six, seven, uh, <laughs> 10 times of that of um, Angola. Yeah. And if you're looking at population and squad values, it means that everything, Nigeria, is outweighing Angola. But it is important to note this. It is not the size of the dog in the fight that matters, but it is the fight of, it is the fight. Size. It is the fight inside the dog mm. that matters. That is what the American writer, Mark Twain, says. Yeah. It is important to not look at your size and think, that, oh, everything, because Nigeria you big. can just walk over anything at all. This is to stone. And those <laughs> talkers who have started nailing the game as a game of shame. Eh? A game of shame. <laughs> okay. <laughs> now, let's look at the head-to-head -head, um, form guide of South Africa and Angola. Yeah. Angola and South Africa, um, Angola and Nigeria have met um, nine times. And surprisingly, 
Nigeria has won only twice. Angola has also won twice. In those nine games, five of them have ended in draws. And in this is the last five meetings. Both teams have scored four goals. And, South Af and Angola has won one. Nigeria too has won one. And when it mattered most in 2004, that is the 2006 World Cup qualifiers, mm. Angola egged out the win. That secured the, the qualification to the 2006 World Cup. And this is the first meeting of the five. Nigeria won that one all right. That was a, a 2002 uh, World Cup qualifier. And in 2002, that's a 2004 Afghan qualifier. Yeah. It, the first leg ended goalless. And then in the second leg in 2003, they played out a 2-2 two -two. draw. In that game, Aqua, the, high, the top scorer of Angola, top scorer, yeah. scored in that game. Then Figuero also scored in that game. I think he scored the, the like only that. goal in 2004. Like in 2004. Like yes. <laughs> <laughs> In the World Cup qualifier, he scored a decisive, scored a decisive goal. goal as well. yeah. And this is the, uh, Nigeria's last five games. In those, they've won three of them, drew one, and lost one. That is a friend. The, the one they've lost is a friendly before the mm. AFCON. Yeah. Oh. And in all of them, they scored five goals and conceded three. At the AFCON, they've conceded just one. And that is the least any team has conceded up to this point. Mm. And in in looking at the performances of all teams in the last 16, they, they are still the least team to concede. If you are looking at the others, the others that have considered the least is three. And this is Angola's last five games. In those fi last five games, Angola have won four of them and drew just one. Mubarak roll it back to the Angola form. They've won four of them and drew just the friend, the, their last friendly before the AFCON. So, uh, in the first group game, they drew 1-1-2 one, one, against uh, Algeria. And in the second one, they won 3-2 against Mauritania. Apart from that, they've kept three clean, uh, two, two clean sheets. Before this, they've not kept three consecutive clean sheets in an AFCON before. Mm. The same for Nigeria. Mm. They are on a run of three consecutive clean sheets. Before that, they've not done four consecutive before. So it is something they are looking to improve or achieve both teams to for concede. the first time yes <laughs> <laughs> both teams to concede <laughs> yes <laughs> so now let's move to the optographic it is talking about the teams with the least uh, it, this game we are going to see tomorrow at uh, tonight yeah. it is a game of two teams playing counter attacking okay. football of all the eight teams left in the competition angola has the least of average possession, that is 44. And they have the highest of shots attempted from fast breaks, that is five. And Nigeria are the second team in term, least in terms of average possession, 45. And have the second highest in terms of um, shots attempted from fast breaks. It means that this game we are going to see a very counter-attacking game and teams that will sit back and try to advance on counters. So it's going to be a really, maybe a really boring game looking at teams that don't go out to, not typical of Nigeria, but yeah. at this tournament, that is what they are driving on. Them. Yes. There are a lot of records that they will be, both teams will be looking to um, protect. protect and break, as I've mentioned some. Yeah. So Angola, before this, they've not kept, in their, they've, uh, they've participated in the AFCON in the, before this, eight times, and in all of them, they've won just four games. And this, they've won they three. three. It means that they could be looking to set a new record of winning four consecutive games yeah. in one tournament for the first time. And, and that's a very <coughs> important um, statistic that he just gave, because if you do the average of the games that they have played, and look at even the total number, Angola have played 26 games. Yes. At the AFCON. And won just four. And they won just four. Before this yeah. competition. Wow. But at this AFCON, one they are one win away from equaling that, that run. Yeah. So it means that per credentials, what I've done before in the preview, if a team is going to win this tournament, the team has to concede just two goals. Mm. And so far, it is only Nigeria with the teams that are left in the competition that has conceded only one. Mm. It means that they have the 
statistics behind them, them. But can they do it? This game, I'm really afraid for Nigeria. But <laughs> <laughs> this week, I hope after the game, still will be here. I share uh, your optimism uh, of, yeah. of Angola. Yeah. But, well, I mean, so something just, yeah. just just caught my attention. Very out well. of the eight uh, I, out of the eight teams or countries there, mm. yeah. something very fascinating for our former winners and for our year to also leave the trophy. Yeah. And so it tells you that perhaps a new side might leave the trophy or I mean a former winner might so might uh, what, also what's certain here. is that we're gonna have a first time a former winner since twenty nineteen. Why, 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 all of so teams, certain about that? No, all of the teams who won those previous editions are out. Yeah. In fact, let's, you have to take it as far back as 2017. Okay. Because Arikos won the last one in 2015. That's true, yeah. 17, yeah. Cameroon, yeah. 19, Algeria, uh, 21, Senegal. Senegal. All of them are out. Yeah. All that, of them are out. That, that sure is an interesting, uh, you know, statistic. And that is going to bring us uh, to now looking at... Um, what we want to see in the semi-final stage. I know it's a bit early. <laughs> we're going to come back on Monday and we're going to do a full review. Me, I want to see Angola. You want to see Angola in the semi-finals? What about you? Any surprise elements in the semi-final? Um, Quebec for me. Okay. What about you, Karim? Angola. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Abdul owes us a goal today. Okay. And it's there with one graphic now. It's there with one graphic. But, okay. Go ahead. It's sure. there with one graphic. Yeah. That is the players to watch. Mm. Okay. I don't know if Mubarak has it. So the, the, let me just talk about it, if, even if it's not there. Yeah. So the players to watch, certainly for Nigeria, it is Victor Osimhen. Yeah. Mm. And in four games, he has scored one goal yeah, and provided one assist. In, the, in those same four goals, if you are looking at his short conversion rate, he's averaging, he's ha, he has a short conversion rate of 6.67. Mm. That is, he attempted 15 shots mm. and he scored only one goal. It's very poor. It means that to score in this game, he needs 15 shots to score. <laughs> But let's look at that of Angola. Mm. Jelson um, Dalla. Dalla. Yep. In four games, he scored four goals. In those same four games, he has provided one assist. Yeah. And his conversion rate is 50%. Yeah. It means that he needs two shots to yes. score a goal. So he's taking eight shots. Eight yeah. shots. For every two goal, shots he takes, he scores one result in a goal. And if you are looking at players that have attempted more than eight shots, he's the second with the highest conversion rate. Yeah. That is the only player to convert... Um, in Sui, he has in attempted nine, nine shots and scored and five goals. Has about 55 point something yeah. conversion rate. And Dala has a 50 percent conversion, conversion rate. rate. So he's the same guy I was saying has created eight chances. Yes, yeah. and is among the highest. The ones. highest. Yeah. If the, yes, that's true. Uh, key passes. Yes, the, he's the highest yeah. player in terms of that. And based on the numbers, I think yeah, Nigeria have considered just one goal yeah. throughout from the group phase up till now. But I think you look at the numbers and I think that the back line of Nigeria really has a cost to war. I think that they, they, they need to have a plan of how they are going to keep, mm. I mean, down very quiet. Uh, because I think that the least opportunity that you give him, I think that he, he will try to put yeah. the back And this is especially on moments it. where, you know, you're having, you know, the Angolans go on a high press yeah. and decide to yeah. run at you on the wings and, you know, play what we probably would refer to as the modern day multi-system yeah. where the late coach, Ade, God bless his soul, will tell you that you find open spaces, move into them, create your chances, and bury yeah, them. The Force the spaces yeah, it, yeah. itself. Look, for the conundrum that Dala Mabululu presents, you don't cure it with half-hearted defending. Because he has shown that he's not a one-dimensional player. He does not mm. only score goals. He can create... Yes. And yes. if you look at the chances that he's created, variety of them... Even mm. if you're looking at the quality of chances... He has used in scoring those four goals he has scored. Yeah. They are very, he has, he's accumulating about 1.3 XG. It means that he's wow. expected to score just a goal <laughs> and he scored four. Out of the four. <laughs> <laughs> well, who emerges the goal king? That's another very big question we'll be answering. Let's get the quarterfinal stage out and then we probably would see, uh, you know, what happens. But Karim, thank you so much. It's been wonderful. Uh, thanks so much, guys. Uh, big games coming up this weekend, and we sure are going to be here on Monday to bring you all of the analysis on AFCON today. Thank you all so much for watching. Monday is the date, and is your team still in the tournament? Well, if it's not, then you'd have to look for another team to support. But uh, the action is right here, the analysis and all the projections on AFCON today. Thank you so much to our sponsors, MTN. <laughs> well, thanks to MTN. MTN everywhere you go. MTN, our proud sponsor for AFCON today here on Joy Prime.
We'll be back on Monday.